Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to uh, the uh, Academic Forum uh, discussion today. Why don't we get started? Um, we have four panelists, uh, but parking and directions at Wayne can be daunting sometimes, and, and Ellen Lipton is on her way. So we should get started as, as she makes her way here. I'm Haigo Shagan. I'm a professor in the Communication Department, and I'll be moderating the panel. To begin, though, let me just uh, go over a couple of things uh, about the panel. Uh, this, the, the panel is organized, the Academic Forum is organized by the Council of Representatives of the AUPAFD, which is the faculty and staff union uh, at, at Wayne State University. The chair of the Council of Representatives is Kristen Chinnery. There, thank you, Kristen. Um, and if your unit is not represented, uh, make sure to speak with her and, and, and uh, to get representation on the council. The whole affair is helped greatly by Michelle Fecto, the executive director of the AAUP AFT chapter, Michelle, and Tammy Force, who is the executive assistant. Tammy, thank you. And chairing the whole thing uh, is Charlie Parrish, the president of the uh, AAUP AFT union. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we've had a number of these forums uh, already this year. We've had one on benefits, on political action, on post-election analysis, on tenure, on Article 24. Today is on higher education policy, and then we'll have one next month as well on online teaching. The idea here is uh, to create a space where faculty and staff can discuss issues relevant to their stay, to their lives at Wayne State, as well as um, to have a say at times on policy making uh, before the policy gets set. So for those important reasons, we created Academic Forum. Today's panel, uh, let me briefly introduce it before I introduce the panelists, is on higher education policy. Uh, Detroit News wrote an article on this uh, last month, and, and it's a conversation that's in the news and at Wayne State commonly. Under the current performance funding formula, Wayne State really gets no points uh, with, with Lansing, with the state legislature, when it comes to funding the university. We don't get any benefit for having the kinds of students we have uh, who are often part-time, who have jobs, who, who, who take longer to, to finish, and so our 34% graduation rate after six years is one of the lowest uh, in, the, in the state. Uh, and we don't get any benefit for having a higher number of graduate students in fields such as medicine or law, where most of the lawyers in this region are from Wayne State. Many of the doctors in this region are also graduates of Wayne State. Many of the school teachers are graduates of Wayne State, and so on. We are slated to get a 0.6% uh, increase from the state for the upcoming year. 0.6% is less than what Grand Valley State University will get, Oakland University, Central Michigan University, Ferris State University, University of Michigan Flint, Michigan Technological University, Northern Michigan University, Western Michigan University, Lake Superior State University, Michigan State University, wow. University of Michigan Ann Arbor, University of Michigan Ann Arbor, I mean uh, Dearborn, Saginaw Valley State University, all of whom will get more money than Wayne State will. And this, if it comes to pass, uh, will obviously severely affect Wayne State's um, uh, funding uh, resources, um, especially with a cap on tuition increases under the current proposed budget as well, resulting in uh, estimated by our president 10 to $15 million uh, shortfall cuts, essentially, at Wayne State in the coming year. So this is a serious issue that affects all of us, faculty, staff, and students. And today's discussion is on that. We've assembled a panel of experts who have either a hand in what goes on in Lansing or who at least know very well what happens there. Um, so let me introduce to you uh, our panelists. Uh, nearest to me is Representative Adam Zemke. State Rep Adam Zemke is serving his second term, representing Michigan's 50th, 55th House district, district, which includes the northern part of the city of Ann Arbor, a portion of the city of Milan, the townships of Ann Arbor, Augusta, Pittsfield, and York. He sits on the Appropriations Committee, and serves as a minority vice chair on the Education Committee. Before serving in the legislature, Zemke worked as an engineer in the aerospace, defense, and automotive fields. He holds a bachelor's and master's degrees from the College of Engineering at Michigan State University. Zemke has served on the Dexter Township Public Safety Advisory Committee, the City of Ann Arbor's Housing and Human Services Advisory Board, and the Washtenaw County Community Action Board. 
a fifth <laughs> generation Washtenaw County resident. Zemke graduated from Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor and has lived in the community his entire life. <laughs> Next to uh, Representative Zemke is uh, Julie Rowe. Uh, Julie Rowe is the Legislative Mobilization Coordinator for the American Federation of Teachers, Michigan. As the organization's staff lobbyist, Julie serves as liaison to legislators and government officials advocating for Michigan's public school employees. She also works to engage AFT Michigan members in legislative and political advocacy. Prior to joining AFT Michigan, Julie worked for the American Association of University Women as the Midwest Public Policy Organizer and for a number of political campaigns on field mobilization and communications. Julie studied sociology <laughs> at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. And to my far right is Representative State Representative Sherry Gay Danyogo, who has a master's in education and is in her first term as state representative of Michigan's 8th district, serving Northwest Detroit, including the Brightmore and the Grand Mont Rosedale communities. Representative Gay Danyogo is an educator, former Detroit City Council staff member, and community organizer dedicated to transforming Michigan's education systems. As a Detroit public school science teacher, Gay Dagnogo learned firsthand the value of good education systems and the struggles <coughs> classrooms are facing. She has previously led community engagement projects funded by the City of Detroit, UAW Region 1A, AFL-CIO, Asks Me Council 25, Great Start Collaborative, the Kresge Foundation, the Kellogg Foundation, UCLA, United Way of Southeast Michigan, and the Skillman Foundation. She knows the importance of connecting community with their neighbors and leaders to solve problems. Gay Danyogo hopes to bring disability to build partnerships in the legislature in order to support quality public education, academic accountability, small business development, job creation, protecting our seniors, and community safety. She sits on the Tourism and Recreation as well as the Financial Services Committees. Rep. Gay Danyogo is the proud mom of one son, Jordan, who is with us today and the current resident and former vice president of North Rosedale Park Civic Association where she remains actively engaged. And let me read you the, uh, the uh, bio of Ellen Lipton who is on her way. Um, Ellen Lipton served as a Democratic member of the Michigan House of Representatives from 2009 to 2014 until she was term limited out of office. During that time, she served as minority vice chair of the Education Committee <coughs> and served on the Appropriations Committee. Lipton is a patent attorney from Huntington Woods and remains a staunch advocate for public education. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and so as we do with, uh, with academic forums, um, we begin with having each of the panelists say a few words about the topic in general. And then we'll get into some specific questions as well as conversation between and among everyone here. And, and questions are welcome uh, as we go along. So if we can begin, um, would you like to start, uh, Adam? Sure. Um, do you want to start with the question number one that we provided? If you'd like, the general overview, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you know, one of the first questions I know that, uh, that we were asked to speak on this panel is, is kind of to give an overview of the education appropriations process. Um, and uh, so I, being that the, the topic is uh, today is concentrated around higher education, I should probably put this mic on first. That would be helpful. I apologize. Um, the, uh, the higher education appropriations process is, uh, it uses a formula-based system, which is very similar to um, uh, the system for community colleges and uh, also at least the current system for K-12 through entities. Um, the, so really, uh, if you look at how well Wayne State does um, by comparison to our other universities, uh, that's where the differences come in. When you, when you hear about, uh, for instance, the governor proposing a 2% increase, uh, that's if, if you receive the entire uh, increase based on the performance criteria. Obviously, 0.6 is less than that. And so um, in doing a little bit of research as to how Wayne State uh, has uh, done on the performance criteria, by the way, the performance criteria is set out by uh, at least as proposed by the administration, and then um, 
then uh, can be changed by the legislature because the legislature is the uh, budget appropriating body uh, of the state government. But, uh, you know, Wayne State um, has uh, suffered by comparison for a variety of reasons. The, the chief reason, as best we can uh, discern, is uh, that uh, universities in the state of Michigan are, are tiered. And uh, the top tier, if you will, uh, and this is for relative comparison from university to university, and the top tier are, are research-based universities, so Wayne State, Michigan State, and uh, the University of Michigan. And there is, uh, in terms of that part of the formula, uh, Wayne State does not do as well. Um, and so it's kind, of, it's kind of like you are held to a, uh, a standard w that Michigan and Michigan State are held to, but some of the other universities, for instance, Grand Valley was one that was referenced, is held to a different standard in that category. Uh, and that hurts you. And you mean U of M and Arbor only uh, in this tiered system? Yeah, I believe U of M and MSU are in that tiered no, system. No, it's not Dearborn and not Flint. Correct, correct. Yeah, that's what I meant. I apologize. Uh, U, U of M and Arbor. Um, there are, uh, additionally, uh, there are some other criteria that have typically been put into the performance funding uh, areas, uh, such as tuition restraint and uh, percentage of uh, expenditures by uh, comparison to students. And so, um, uh, I'm so, yeah, percentage of expenditures by comparison to students. So basically, uh, the cost per student that you're spending um, in, uh, in the university. And, and that's, those are two areas that Wayne State is typically not done as well in, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's, that's really what the crux fit is. You know, 2% is, uh, is not really a funding increase. I mean, it's not even enough to keep up the cost of inflation if you get the entire percentage, right? Um, and so, uh, obviously, the 0.6 is even, is even worse. And I think uh, you all tr uh, attempt, or your board tried to compensate for that a few years ago, and, and you, you paid for it by raising tuition, unfortunately. Um, and I sympathize with the folks who made those decisions. I also sympathize with the students because I'm uh, paying off my college loans still as well. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, but that's really the, the problem here. And, you know, I know we'll go into this uh, in a later question, um, but the real problem is, is that the state has been uh, chronically underfunding higher education uh, for uh, well over a decade, um, you know, really back into the late 90s. Uh, and so until that changes, um, you know, these small increases, if you will, are going to continue to be a problem, uh, you know, really regardless of the performance criteria. Um, if, you, if you look at the way tuition uh, used to pay for, or tuition as a percentage of total university expenditures in the state in the late 70s, it was 75% uh, of, of state aid covered the cost of university expenditures and 25% covered, uh, uh, was paid for by tuition. Now it's basically inverted. And, uh, and that is because of decrease in state aid. And this is not common to Michigan, unfortunately. Uh, this is uh, very reflective in state universities across the country. Um, chronic underfunding of, of uh, public higher education is really the problem. So. Um, if we can go to Sherry, staying on the on the sort of current members on the on in, in Lansing legislative members, um, could you comment on on the situation? So, <clears throat> so I come to this uh, with a new lens, um, a different lens, but also as an alum um, of Wayne State University, uh, a teacher uh, from your College of Ed, um, also realizing the comparison between the impact um, that Wayne State is receiving. Uh, and how that compares to the impact of funding that Detroit Public Schools is receiving. So just left a meeting um, uh, right before this one, meeting actually with your president, uh, your government affairs director, uh, just addressing the shortfall that uh, Wayne State will experience. Um, unlike um, Ellen uh, and Adam, uh, I don't have extensive knowledge of the appropriations process. However, I do understand um, organizing, uh, lobbying, and making certain that your message gets across, but also the unintended con consequences um, of how tuition has increased because of the shortfalls by the state, um, as well as uh, the narrative that we face in Detroit that not only impacts Detroit Public Schools, but also impacts Wayne State University, 
And so it's the whole kind of uh, Detroit versus everybody. Um, so you have Michigan State uh, in Lansing who has direct access uh, continually working directly with uh, members of the legislature and the administration, uh, whereas uh, Wayne State University, um, you have a lobbying firm uh, and you have someone that uh, occasionally that is there um, on the ground, but the access to every day uh, building the relationships, sharing your story, um, is a part of the problem that results um, in these shortfalls. I know that there are um, some differences in the student population um, as it relates to retention uh, with students, uh, minorities, students of color, uh, but also the working population that you serve, uh, as well as the length of time that it takes for them to complete their programs, as well as uh, the number of Pell Grant students that you receive as well. Uh, but just uh, as being a member of this coalition, the new coalition, uh, the, the Coalition for the Future Detroit School Children, which Michelle is also a member of, we're tasked with coming up with recommendations uh, that would help to improve K-12 education. But I think we need to have a broader conversation um, about how we build better partnerships with our School of Ed and with our colleges and universities on how we improve um, academic delivery pre-K uh, through the completion of higher ed. And so there are a number of unintended consequences of not being um, or working collectively or, or seeing this as a continuum. Uh, and so we need to change that. And I see some of your questions later on on the, on the form uh, kind of speaks to that on how you do a better job of getting ahead of the administrative recommendations. So just in my quest for knowledge and learning, how we even get to the process of where, what you might be asking or lobbying for. So where are those conversations with the administration in like late November or December? Uh, making sure you have those conversations early on so that you are thought of um, for potential increase early on, taking away whatever other issues you might be facing or the criteria uh, Adam spoke to or Rep Zemke spoke to the tiered standard that you're up against with respect to uh, Michigan State, University of Michigan, we're not comparing apples to oranges. There are some differences. But how are you teeing up those conversations early on uh, to make sure that you're not being subjected to the same uh, criteria um, uh, as the other universities that may have a different student population? Uh, and then making certain that uh, those recommendations are put into the governor's um, uh, uh, recommendations early, budget recommendations early, as opposed to waiting until we're later on in the process to only see shortfall and now have to ask basically for something to be moved from somewhere else. So that's that's just kind of how my thinking um, around that. I know that's a lot, uh, but uh, it's just kind of the framework. I just believe as an organizer to approach things early on and, and look at the timeline for where decisions are made and making sure that the story and the narrative is reshaped early on so that your ask is it's more receptive as opposed to um, having to push back on what's been recommended um, that doesn't fit within uh, the scope of what you need. I'm going to come to Ellen next and, 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 and uh, come to Julie at the end because Julie's perspective is from the other side as a lobbyist. And so staying still on the sort of the legislative side, uh, Ellen, we introduced you, by the way, while you were still not here. And we said good things about you. Um, so you've been, you were, you you have a longer history uh, in the legislature, and so maybe you can look back and 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 give us an overview of the of, of how it's been over the last um, six years or so. Um, how how do you see things changing? How how were they before? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Is there any chance as as you've seen things um, uh, evolve over time? Yes. Um, so. Unfortunately, because of term limits, when you've served six years, you're considered to be sort of the, the old lady or the old gentleman in the group, um, which I think in and of itself is, is a problem. Um, but the, um, the winds of change systemically, um, because when I was on appropriations, um, in order to really learn the budget, I talked to people who had been uh, – education chairs uh, long before me. And they're still around. Um, they tend to either be consultants or lobbyists or academics. Um, in fact, one, one, of, one of them 
um, is right here at Wayne State, a great, great repository of, uh, of information, Mike, uh, Professor Mike Adonisio. Um, and uh, so I really wanted to sort of learn historically um, where we were going with funding. And what we've seen, um, at least in the past 10 years, and certainly in the six years um, that I was uh, in the legislature, and most importantly under this particular governor, is that the, um, the, 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 the thought process and the power in education, which had always been centered in southeastern Michigan, has moved dramatically to the west part of the state. And what I mean by that is the people that are um, at the table and advising the governor um, are all coming from the western part of the state, okay? And their philosophy about education is very, very different um, than mine, okay? Um, so what we're going to see, um, we're going to see, and I think we already have seen it, we're going to see a lot of um, proposals that favor um, a more market-based view of education Okay, um, we're going to see in the guise of data, okay, um, because data can be massaged um, to, uh, to really whatever outcome, political outcome you want, right? Um, so we're going to see a lot of metrics or data that is going to miraculously end up favoring old Grand Valley, hypothetically. <laughs> By golly, in the four years that I was on appropriations, Grand Valley always seemed to get an increase. It's not a coincidence that when you walk around the campus of Grand Valley, the entire campus is named after someone by the name of Dick DeVos. <laughs> <laughs> no. And Mr. Van Andel. <laughs> um, and so um, you, you tend to see metrics like performance-based funding that is oftentimes focused on um, standardized tests um, and uh, uh, proposals that would literally reward teachers um, based on or reward teacher preparation programs that would be tied to not just the scores of their their, their graduate students, but actually tying it back to this, the, the, the test scores of the students that these teachers are teaching. I mean, think about that, right? You're actually, there are proposals floating around that would actually reward co uh, colleges of education in the state based on the standardized scores of the teacher students that would then harken back to the preparatory program that the teacher went to. That's like two iterations removed, okay? Um, so the, the, the political reality in Lansing um, and un, under this governor um, is really, really based on a system of metrics um, that is really designed to reward universities that really have sort of bought into um, what I would call the corporate mm. view of, of education, okay? Um, a view that says that um, if you throw everyone together and you let them compete for a shrinking and shrinking pot of money, that somehow good things will come of that, as opposed to just really what we've seen, um, urban universities that have a very important component um, in educating our urban population, simply dying on the vine, okay? Um, so not to really just leave you with a message of doom because, you know, that's not, that's not a very good thing to do. Um, one of the things that um, I was also asked to talk about was really how to respond to that. Um, when I practiced patent law before I went into uh, the legislature, and now I'm I'm out of the legislature, but I would always tell my clients is that knowledge is power. And the first thing that I tell people when they ask, well, how can I be a better lo lobbyist for my organization, is to first arm yourself with the knowledge of what you're up against, mm -hmm. okay? The reality is, is that 
the, um, the political climate in Lansing is such that they're not really embracing universities like Wayne State um, the way they used to or the way they should. Okay? Um, and so, so knowing that is half the battle. The second part of the battle is formulating a response to that. Okay? Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that Wayne State does have is that of the three research universities, it's the only one that occupies the unique position of not only being a research university, which puts you in a unique position, but also being an urban university and a university dedicated to urban learners. Okay, there is no other university um, in the state that can um, that can boast that type of mission. Um, now you can look at that as a as a liability, and certainly in the past several years, I'm sure it has felt like a liability. Or you can turn that into um, what I would argue would be a positive. Now what Sherry talked about is really kind of interesting because the reality is is that these performance-based metrics, they're not set in stone. Okay? In fact, I was in the legislature on appropriations when they came to be. And when those of us in the minority started asking, where did they come from? Like, who came up with these performance-based metrics? It was interesting because the people that were there testifying said, well, we just kind of came up with them ourselves in conjunction with meetings with the governor's office. So what has been uh, sort of um, touted now as set in stone, because oftentimes the prior year, the, the current budget, the boilerplate um, that sort of characterizes the money um, in a current budget is generally brought forward from the budget year before. And so everyone in Lansing has this, because, because everyone has amnesia, right? I mean, people there have only been there for, you know, the most six years. Um, everyone thinks that, well, this is set in stone. Well, the reality is, is that boilerplate can get rewritten, yeah. okay? Um, and particularly if you are a university like Wayne State that has a particular mission and, a and occupies a particular place, boilerplate can be written to reward universities that occupy that position. Okay? Uh, that's, uh, that's a great point, Alan. Maybe we can uh, have Julie now talk from the other side of this uh, divide because she is a lobbyist and she has had to deal with this, the, you know, these issues as, as, as you've all described. So, Julie, how do uh, you see it? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, so from the other side, from that perspective, um, as a lobbyist for AFT Michigan, meaning for um, all of you who are, are AFT members um, and, and for um, a lot, largely those organizations themselves. So we sort of lobby on behalf of, of all of you as employees, but also on, on behalf of the institutions to make sure that, um, um, well, to fight for fair funding. Um, the big problems, um, I think um, Ellen, Ellen really um, enumerated, is that we have a system that is set up to create winners and losers um, based on competition. You hear a lot of that. Um, a lot of the discussion in Lansing is based on um, best practices, performance funding, um, market um, you know, choice, and competition. And um, you know, competition is all well and good. It's the reason my phone's so fancy. Um, but when you're talking about education and you have winners and losers, mm -hmm. um, when that loser is a student, um, and when that loser is an institution or a community or a city, that's where the problem becomes. That when you when you create that system of winners and losers. So performance-based funding um, comes from the perspective and a philo philosophy that it, on surface value, seems good, right? You want more students graduated. You want them to graduate in a timely fashion so they're not accumulating a lot of debt. Um, you want these things. But they focus so much on output that they, that they don't pay attention to the input that, that's required to get that. So if you've got a, a university like Wayne State and you have um, uh, struggles with retention, you know, getting students past that first semester, let alone that first year, let alone through four years, what really ends up being six years, um, it, it requires a lot of different kinds of input 
um, and a lot of different work that the student, you know, the, the university needs to do to help students be prepared. Um, I'm sure as you find that sometimes students are coming to class without the basic skills that you think that they need to be able to learn in an educate in, in a in a higher uh, institution of higher education. Um, so you've got these different struggles and things that you're competing with. Um, while the university um, is being starved for funding. Um, one thing that's interesting about performance-based funding is you kind of think of it as twofold. There's this funding formula that, mu that, that the university kind of goes through this magic box and, at the out and then they come out based on, um, their, based on these metrics, total degree completion, six-year graduation rate Pell Grants. Um, and then after that, so they're given a percentage. In Wayne State's it's 0.6, Grand Valley's I think 3.8 or 3.9 um, at the top level um, and then they go through this metric and that's their number. That's what they get as long as then they go through the second phase which is maintaining um, transfer agreements, uh, not uh, pay, um, allowing for dual enrollment regardless of if those credits were used for AP classes in high school for instance, and tuition restraint. Tuition restraint um, uh, the component of that for performance base last year and last budget cycle was the university has to keep tuition under 3.2. This year they're dropping it to 2.9. Now, again, there's a, there's a question here. If they're saying that we can only increase your funding by 2%, but you have to cap your tuition increase at 2.9%, um, there's sort of a, a disagreement there. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a logic question that you have to be asked. But again, money is tight, or so we think, um, or so we're told. So um, these questions come into consideration. So as a lobbyist and as someone who works with our members to encourage them to communicate to Lansing, we have to talk about things like why is a six-year graduation rate so important if that's what your metric is going to be. Now, granted, I think the bigger question we need to ask is why are we doing performance-based funding at all? There's a, there's a philosophical difference. Um, but we're in a reality that either that we're, that we're struggling between that. Do we fight the big fight? Do we, do we chip away at the little death by a thousand cuts? So we have to do a little bit of both. But the questions I like to ask, um, or that I get asked by legislators a lot, and I've heard this, the, the, the Pell Grant metric, for instance, to, to reward um, schools that um, encourage low-income students to attend and, and so therefore have a lot of Pell Grant recipients, um, there are legislators who don't want that in there. That was a big fight to get that included in any of the performance metrics to allow schools like Wayne State um, to sort of compete given their different um, student demographics. Um, but the six-year graduation rate. There are legislators who believe that you should be able to graduate in four years regardless of whether you're working, whether you're paying for loans, whether you're a commuter student, whether you've got a family, and all these other things that four years might not be realistic for that particular student. So, but legislators don't necessarily hear this, right? They don't hear from their student, the students at these schools, they don't hear from the instructors as much as we would like them to. Mm -hmm. um, and so a big part of my work is to work with members like you and, um, and our members at other universities to say, talk to, talk to legislators and talk about the reality of what it's like. Because I guarantee you they're coming from a very different perspective. Um, very few legislators are coming from the perspective of what Wayne State University even is. Um, and, and, and what it means uh, to be a student at Wayne, to teach at Wayne, um, or any, largely any of our universities, or they're, and they're not thinking about it in today's terms frequently. Um, they're thinking about it in terms of 20, 30 years ago when they went to school. And as Adam, or as Representative Zemke pointed out, um, in, the, in the late 70s, tuition was, was, you could afford it working minimum wage over a summer and you could pay your tuition for a year. Um, I certainly couldn't do that as a student, and I'm still paying down my student loans. Right. And I could, well. right? And I and I couldn't finish in four years. I had to work at the same time. I went to the University of Michigan. I got a great education, and um, but it was not it was not easy, let alone to do it in four years while while having to work and and help support family and and that sort of a thing. So, my my best recommendation and my my ask really is to talk with legislators and not just the legislator who represents you because typically if you're in Southeast Michigan those are legislators who understand or who get it or who know but talk to the legislators outside of the state and explain to them why a vested interest in Wayne State benefits them. Thank you Julie. So I'm going to open it up for questions given that there are so many here uh, but a question sort of hanging that I'd like you to keep in mind 
is that we've danced around the, the, the words Democrats and Republicans. Uh, we've said the western side of the state and, and Grand Valley, but, and, 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 and yet this, this part of the, uh, the issue always is somewhere nearby. That is, uh, this is a democratic city, uh, overwhelmingly, um, whereas Michigan's legislature is up and down, governor on down is all Republican. The western state is primarily Republican, the southeast is, is not. And so, um, is there at, at, at some level here a, a serious Democrat versus Republican issue? And, and is the solution here only retaking some part of, of Lansing? Um, and it's not a great surprise that everyone here is a Democrat um, because we had difficulty getting Republican members to come and, and join us. Um, so um, is, is, is it, it will, will conversations take care of this? Will no, knowledge of the issue take care of this? Will Will, th will there need to be coalition building to really get at this? Uh, or is, is the bottom line getting out the vote and changing the face of Lansing? I mean, uh, how difficult is changing Wayne State's situation uh, given where we are and given, uh, given the composition of, of, of Lansing? So, yeah, so I typically approach things with a, me a measure of optimism, and, and I've been told that once I – get my first six months in, in Lansing, maybe that will change somewhat. Uh, but I just, um, as being an organizer, as being someone who has been a staunch uh, blue through and through Democrat and really advocating strongly on the things I believe in, and now having an opportunity to have conversations with uh, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and the administration, I believe we have a huge responsibility to first share our story. Uh, to do a better job of sharing the narrative, uh, do a better job of knowing the landscape um, and be willing to articulate what's unique um, about Wayne State and what um, it provides throughout the state, uh, as Ellen pointed out, that no other university is able um, to point out. And not just pushing the burden onto the student body, because I am a former student. Uh, so uh, we, the state disinvested in higher education and um, our tuition continued to grow. Uh, but now this is becoming a real crisis and how much can you raise the tuition? So it's a responsibility to be knowledgeable uh, and to share the story. And so I think when we sit down and show how um, continued cuts or, or using a performance-based model will create a ripple effect, not just for Wayne State or Detroit, uh, but throughout our state. So, I mean, there's one particular... Uh, a program that I've, I've learned about recently, um, a graduate medical education program. So it's a program that's through DMC that uh, Wayne State uh, benefits from uh, with their uh, medical students. And there is, is a state and federal uh, uh, program whereby uh, for every dollar that the state um, invests, uh, the Fed sends two dollars. Well, uh, the governor perhaps, I guess, does not see value in uh, DMC uh, being uh, providing 20% of all of the state's indigent care uh, and the loss of revenue that will come from cutting that program. Uh, but who's actually advocating for the program? Who's communicating uh, the benefit? Who's lifted that up um, from Wayne State? Um, as well as you talked about the population of having urban students, and Ellen said not seeing that as a negative, but seeing it as a positive, who's articulated that in a way and in a fashion where you're not just saying, well, we are the one that takes the most Pell Grant students, but also showing what is the cost um, of really educating, what is the cost uh, and the benefit uh, to community of having students who are working and are attending school, who's lifting those stories up? And if we're not doing that in a collective way, um, then we have to own some of that responsibility. But I believe that we can do a better job uh, in sharing the narrative and sharing our stories and sharing what's great um, about Wayne State University and having presence and not just relying on a lobbyist to tell those stories, getting Wayne State students um, up to Lansing as well and, and the faculty getting them up as well so that they can articulate and also share that it's a much bigger picture than just what's happening in Detroit or at Wayne State but how this uh, impacts our state overall. And I think that's what we have to do a better job of. Yeah, Adam, do you want to add? 
Yeah, I uh, I will just second uh, Sherry's comment uh, really explicitly. You know, the uh, the the way that Lansing works is based on stories. Um, in my biography, it was stated that I, was, I have two degrees in engineering, and so I came to Lansing thinking that maybe if I just convinced somebody enough. Uh, numerically that, that this was the, the clear right decision, you could show the statistics for it, that they would uh, automatically, uh, you know, make the right decision, right? No, it doesn't work like that. Um, and, uh, but the power of personal testimony and the ability to share really the story of why it takes maybe longer than six years right. is something that legislators, one, don't get enough of, and two, can only be found by the folks who have lived it. And, uh, and that's really the critical way to sway hearts and minds and therefore dollars um, in this process. Um, and, uh, you know, it, this is a very, the performance funding uh, category is something that the governor uh, and the uh, legislature put in four years ago, four and a half years ago now. And um, but prior to that, you know, we should own the fact too that the chronic underfunding of universities has gone through s several gubernatorial administrations, two Republican, one Democrat, and that's a problem. And I think it's a pro I think it's a a pro I think it's goes back to that we have. We've just lost sight of what value higher, edu higher education plays in our economy and in our society today. And that's reflected in our lack of prior prioritization of higher education funding. I think that's really the problem here. You know, so, you know, we fight for the scraps in terms of the, the 0 0.6 to 3.5 uh, percentage increases. You know, really what we're talking about here are, is much larger than that. And the only way you're going to affect that much larger picture is to talk about mm -hmm. the stories. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a story of why it took somebody eight years to graduate. Yeah, that might help you, you know, change that performance metric. But it also may change what somebody who has the power to affect funding thinks about higher education and how it plays a role in communities that they've never been a part of. And that's what I think is really important. Uh, and, and that's only going to happen by folks organizing locally on campus and coming up and talking with people continually. And, uh, uh, you know, Lansing is uh, a slow-moving beast. Uh, and the only way to change it is to continue to talk and talk and talk mm -hmm. and be patient and be optimistic. I've managed to, I still have a shred of optimism <laughs> after two years. Um, and, uh, but I really believe that's, that's the way to go. So. Right. Thank you, Adam. So let me open it up to some questions. We have a, a few minutes left. Maybe you can all indulge us for a few more minutes since we began a little late. Um, and please keep your questions short and, and maybe panelists keep, keep your answers uh, brief as well. Uh, yes, Brad. investment in uh, startup companies and all kinds of relationships. They have Van, uh, Van Andel and DeVos. We do have Van Gilbert and Ellis and Ford in this community. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why we can't forge some kind of political strategy to get heavy hitters Absolutely. to go to bat for this community and Wayne State's unique role, which is beyond six year graduation rate. There's a dimension here that needs to be emphasized, which is that you want this place to to be uh, in this mold of recovery or not. Mm -hmm. And if so, you need to make a political bargain that we get off of this indicative set of financial metrics. And I think what is really important about retaining control. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, good point. 
a very good idea. Would you, anyone wants to say anything about it, or we can move to another question? Well, yes, I, yeah. I, I just like to say that there was a recently a meeting by a new um, caucus talent and workforce development talent in place. Talent in place, yep. and it was held um, at Dan Gil Gil Gilbert's shop. And so I know that there is interest, but you'd be surprised, as Ellen pointed out, when she said the line of inquiry around who actually set up these metrics, uh, the performance-based metrics. And they just said, we just kind of sat down and came up with them. I am so amazed as an educator uh, when I have some of these conversations with people and the people that made up the criteria have no inclination or understanding whatsoever um, about education or anything relative to education. So sometimes not having the academicians in the space of giving recommendations and having those conversations with people like Dan Gilbert they simply haven't been asked, or they, it simply hasn't been brought to their attention. And so having something like that in their space to ask for that and showing that this is an impediment or a roadblock to actually realizing what, what uh, the regeneration of Detroit Project is all about, it just needs to be, someone needs to make the ask. And so I, like Adam says, these continued dialogues and conversations are very helpful because here's where we get um, ideas to be pushed forward uh, to advance. I, on, on the last point, I'd like to note, coming in, swearing in on the legislature on the 14th of January, on the 16th, um, I held a uh, tour, a legislative tour of Detroit Public Schools because I felt like legislators were making decisions and many of them hadn't visited our schools. We had about 25 plus civic leaders there from the House, the Senate, commissioners, city council, and some of them, and Adam included, was like, I'm shocked or I'm surprised. Uh, but what I see here today, great schools, uh, great programs that we visited, but that's not the narrative in the newspaper. They don't show kids K through 8 at Flix speaking foreign language fluently, uh, doing math and Chinese. They don't show that. And so if we do a better job of showing and telling our story uh, about Wayne State, then uh, we get solutions like that that integrate great ideas that are, are more thoughtful. Thank you. Yes. I just. Real quick before your question, I, I sit on the Talent in Place Caucus, and uh, I think this is a really good idea, and yes. we'll suggest it to the leadership of the caucus to do a higher education-based uh, uh, session. And I know that uh, the Gilbert folks were very interested in having us back down uh, to do another one, so right. we'll try to do, do it right. down here. So thank you. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. Every conversation about the, this, the, the development of this region from NEI on down has, has, has stressed the, the fact that we have the concentration of, of education of engineers and, and, and software engineers and, and so on in this region, and, and Wayne State is the hub of that. Yep, um, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. It seems to me that the uh, government has been treating the, the, uh, the business of university education in terms of a kind of a laissez-faire economic Performance-based model. You know, you, so you, you don't get something out of it, then then uh, you don't uh, you don't want to pay for it. But it, it seems to me that it's uh, it's colorblind in a lot of ways, in the sense that it it only looks at a certain fraction of the university um, business. It doesn't look at, for example, administrative costs versus faculty costs. And so what you end up having is that any cut that comes down seems to be always affecting the bottom part, the faculty cost, and the students are being affected by it. We have to raise their tuition. At the same time, over the last um, decade or so, we've watched administrative costs here at Wayne State go up by, I don't know what, Charlie, back to two or three? So, I mean, we're not talking 20%. We're talking a lot, right? We're talking a lot. And so what about um, some political movement in, in Lansing to change the metric so that the uh, will force universities to take a close look at their administrative costs versus their faculty costs, so that more money, or if they have, like we're getting, not much money coming in, can be used for where it counts. And that doesn't seem to be So can I take that question to Ellen, given your experience and you seeing the beginning of the, the metrics kind of discussion, what do you think of the possibility of changing uh, the metrics? Yeah. the. Um, 
you know, uh, a wise person once said that history is written by the victors, okay? So I'm going <laughs> to, so, so I'm going to uh, give an iteration of that and that the boilerplate is written by those that are in power, okay? When you think about it, okay, are the faculty members the ones that are in the room really talking to the people about really what kind of metrics we should be looking at in boilerplate? No. Okay, so the, the, the people that are getting rewarded, when you think about it, um, are the administration that hires the lobbyists that are really part of that, you know, upper echelon. Now, I'm not saying that lobbyists are bad or that administrators are bad or what have you, but you have to understand, okay, this is not the word of God, okay? Boilerplate is written during the budget process. It's being written like right now. Okay, because I don't know if you guys have talked at all about the, the rhythm of Lansing and the budget cycle, but budgets begin right after the January Revenue Estimating Conference, right? Okay, everyone talks about, oh my gosh, the state's not going to have enough money for this, that, and the other. Those are real economic projections that are baked into our Constitution. Okay, so we have the January Revenue Estimating Conference, and then the governor's budget comes out the next month. Okay, so that's February. Which means that all of the various appropriations committees, like higher ed, begin meeting at the end of February and March to establish targets that are given to them by what's called the quadrant, which really now is the legislative leaders and the governor that are all basically coming from one party. Okay, so they're given... A, a target that they then have to meet in their budget and everything then flows from that target. So if their target shows a 10% reduction from the prior year's budget because that's where you always begin with, okay, you take the boilerplate from the prior year's budget and carry it forward into the current year, then you're going to start seeing cuts that are oftentimes pretty ham-handed, okay. Um, but the reason why you're seeing um, n not a lot, in my opinion, recognition of the faculty's input is because really they're not being represented and they're not really at the table writing the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the criteria um, that, that's, that makes the money flow in different spots. Let's, let's not do second and third pasta questions. Uh, do you, and if, uh, are there, uh, Julie wanted to have a chance at this question, is that? Yes. Um, I, I think that that's an incredibly, val uh, incredibly important um, thing to understand is, is where these, where power is con concentrated. We can talk about good policy all, all day long, but if the politics aren't there, we're not necessarily going to get it through. Right. Um, and, and I think one thing, these legislators at the table, I, I think, have been incredible champions and, and listen to their constituents in a way that many don't um, and really seek more information and, 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 and do that work to find out what's really going on. Um, but for a lot of legislators, there are a lot of issues. Um, legislators are, are generalists. They have to know um, a little bit about a lot of things and make decisions on them. Um, so they don't necessarily go in depth. And when you don't know an issue deeply, you sometimes don't know what questions to even ask. Right. Um, so one thing that I, yep, I'm getting there. Thanks, Charlie. Um, <laughs> um, one thing that I, I say is, yes, come to Lansing, but Lansing is, and we're going to have a lobby day on March 24th, um, and it's very important for, um, for you to be there. Um, and I, I do say that to everyone in this room, including the students. Um, it is very important. Um, but even more important than that is the relationship that you build. Um, like I said, legislators don't always know the question to ask, but they also, also don't always know who to ask. Um, they don't necessarily know um, where to go for information. They know that, you know, within their constituencies of about 90,000 people, that there are experts there, but they sometimes don't know how to find them unless we go to them first. Um, and then building that relationship is key. Uh, when um, it comes down to the wire and they're about to take a vote, I can lobby them all day long and say things about AFT Michigan's position and labor's position and the education lobby's position. But if they get a call from a constituent who they have a relationship with and who they trust, that's a little bit of a different story. Um, the other thing that's key is, again, um, Lansing, going to Lansing is good for a day. 
um, and you'll get a half an hour meeting or an hour meeting if you're lucky, or you'll pull them off the floor and, and they'll, they'll recognize you and listen to what you have to say. Um, but for legislators who are very busy um, and who meet with a lot of people on a daily basis, but they have coffee hours a couple times a month, and often they're not well attended. Um, so I strongly encourage you to be that person who goes there. Is there anyone here who has gone to an uh, in-district coffee hour or a meeting with the legislator? I see a hand up back there, one up there. Um, okay, that should show you how often people really are there. Um, and you can, you can get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention. You can also hear what the legislator is thinking and prioritizing. But again, they don't necessarily know what these issues are, so give them the reason. Tell the story. Explain who you are. Yes, back it up with facts. Absolutely know what you're talking about. Do your best to, to be re researched. But the, the key is to build that relationship. Thank you. So as you all see, and we have run out of time, um, a key aspect of all of this is to get to know the people making the decisions. And, and, and telling the stories is surprisingly a key component of making, of humanizing the situation, of humanizing the data and numbers so that people actually begin to care about what's going on here. Given the, the, key look, the key developments in this region and, and Wayne State's important position in it, I think we maybe stand a good chance this year with everyone's involvement and, and participation in lobby day maybe even uh, to maybe make a change, make a difference in, in how Wayne State is perceived in the evaluation of, of, uh, of funding from Wayne State. So with that, then uh, let me thank our panelists. Thank you for, for coming and joining us. And thank you all as well for coming and being with us today. Thank you. Um, and to register for Lobby Day with AFC Michigan, um, you can check in with Michelle. Um, Tammy's not here. Or me or Luciana right now. We'll, we'll get you um, hooked up with how to do that. Or you can just go to the AFC Michigan website and register online. And if you don't have one of my flyers for Education Town Hall and Higher Ed, please see me. I have some more right up here.